We're talking this morning, and we've been um, on a series of summer psalms. Psalms are not just for summer. Um, if you didn't know that, let me let you know that right away, that psalms are for any time. Uh, they, they present a lot of dilemmas, if you will, um, but every word and every um, season that the psalmists go through, they come to this place where they find the Lord. They find him to be faithful. They find him to be true. They find him to be holy. And so I'm excited to share a psalm with you um, this morning that's one of my favorites, but we'll get to that in just a second. We're going to talk today about hiding. Yay, right? (laughs) And everybody's like, okay, don't look at me. Listen, here are some just on the internet, an internet search, simple internet search, some secrets that you or I might be hiding. An embarrassing incident, right? You don't want everybody to know. Maybe something that's happened to you. Some of us hide, probably many of us hide, debt. Maybe something in your family history. Maybe some fears, faults, failures, weaknesses. Some of us really, really bad want to hide our past. Maybe you want to hide your middle name. Not going to say who (laughs) might feel that way. Um, I hide a uh, little stack about this big of chocolate-covered espresso beans up in the... See it not in here? Yeah, there's one kid in particular that likes to get into them, and I hide them high up on the shelf, even though he can probably reach it further than I can, um, because I don't want him in my business. (laughs) But listen, a recent survey found that 60% of people have at least one secret that they really don't want anyone finding out about. And most of them have been keeping the secret for at least 15 years. We're not talking about the location of some great fishing hole or some secret thing that you want to keep to yourself, but these are secrets that people worry will affect their lives by changing others' opinions of them. Now, just so happens that I just said something about that child, and I'm going to say it again because he's helping in Life Kids today, so I can say whatever I want about anybody that's not in the room. So girls, you're safe today. But we, there was a few years ago, just a normal Saturday, well, not really normal Saturday, but a Saturday where Josh and I said, okay, we need to make sure everybody's rooms are cleaned up. I don't know if we were going on a trip or we were doing something. We said, everyone needs to go in your rooms and clean up all your stuff. And they're Okay, we're not going to share about how the conditions of their rooms were because that's personal information. But there's one, and I will apologize, probably pay him five bucks later for this story, but his room was a disaster. We're talking like Legos everywhere and toys everywhere, clothes everywhere. And so we told the kids, we turned on music in the hallway upstairs and told the kids, now go and clean up your rooms. And we kind of made periodic checks, you know. So about 10 minutes in, we check in, and we see that the girls still had a long way to go, and he was moving pretty fast, and so we said, wow, you're just doing so good. That's amazing. Go back downstairs. 10 more minutes, he comes downstairs, and he says, I'm done. I'm finished, and we said, you're not finished. There's no way. Your room was a disaster, and so Josh said, well, go up and check, and I walk upstairs, get up to his room, and his room was spotless. Nothing, nothing was on the floor, bed made, everything totally clean. I was like baffled, like shocked, amazed, like, okay, I didn't know that you had this in you, but now we do, so we'll never, ever let you go that long again. And so we were just really impressed and, you know, used that and told the the girls, his sisters, like, your brother just cleaned his room in like 20 minutes tops, and it is clean and they, they didn't understand it. We kind of didn't understand it anyway. Went on with our life, our day. A couple of weeks go by, and it was time Josh and I were getting ready to go on a trip. And so could not, for the life of us, find our big travel suitcase. <clears throat> Looked everywhere for it. Went through all the rooms, all the basement, <clears throat> and I get to his room. In the closet, shoved way back, was a giant suitcase, like this is one you check on to, to the plane. And I pulled out. I was like, what on earth is our suitcase doing in here? And I pull the suitcase out and I open it up. And inside that suitcase was every single thing that had been on his floor that Saturday 
previously and look. <laughs> I will give it to him. He's smart. He's a very, very smart child. But so many of us, I feel like I'm guilty of the same, want to present this, this very good, clean life of, look at this. This is, this is how I'm living. This is how it is. But hidden, maybe in a closet, maybe in your parents' suitcase, is some junk. And things may appear okay for a while. A lot of us get away with it for a long, long time. But eventually, we will be found out. There are times in life, and I wrote down too, there's times when maybe we do want to hide. We want to run and hide. And look, the truth of it is, is that that is our nature. You can just go and read Genesis and find that out. But it's our nature to want to run and hide. But then there's a second time in life we're talking about this, this hiding that sometimes we can feel unseen or unnoticed, overlooked, or even hidden. Have you ever felt that way in life? It's like somebody else keeps getting the promotion. Somebody else keeps finding their mate and getting married. Somebody else has all these things, and you just kind of ask God, like, do you see me? Do you, do you, did you forget about me? I remember being 10 days overdue with my first child sitting in his nursery, rocking in that chair, like, Lord, did you forget me? Can you not see me? Like, is this ever going to happen? But there are times in our life where we can feel like we're hidden. The title of my message today is Not Hiding, But Hidden. Colossians 3, 3 through 4 says this, For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, then you will share in all his glory. So as we talked earlier that neither hiding or being hidden necessarily maybe seem or feel like a good thing. So why does the scripture talk about being hidden in Christ? We're going to talk a little bit about that. And whether we are hiding or we feel hidden, he is there. Has anyone figured out yet which psalm I'm talking about? Maybe you think 91. It's not. There's several other ones that I probably will refer to, but I want to talk today about Psalm 139. An NIV study Bible shares this. Nowhere outside of Job does one find express such profound awareness of how awesome it is to ask God to examine not only one's life, but also one's soul. And on one hand, we have this desire to be known and to be loved. But on the other hand, some of us have this fear of being looked at too closely. We fear being exposed. Maybe we all want some things about us to be just unknown. And that's why one chapter in one version of the Bible that I was looking at above Psalm 139 calls it this, a celebration of God's invasion of our privacy. <laughs> this Psalm thoroughly covers, you know, you read this and you think it's, it's, oh Lord, you've examined my heart, me, me, but really it covers the character of God. And it takes him from that macro giant creator to this micro-caring, loving author of our life. Psalm 139 reminds us that it's not just that God knows everything. He knows me. It's not just that God is everywhere, but he's everywhere with me. It's not just that God created everything. He created me. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. And I don't know that we give enough weight to that statement. So today, let's try to examine it and measure it if we can. Read with me in Psalm 1, 39, verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down, and you're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And I want to talk about a couple of those scriptures there. It says, even if I go up to the heavens, you're there. But it says, if I make my bed in the depths, some of them say, if I make my bed in hell, if I make my bed in Sheol. And I love that the Bible says that. It, your parents ever tell you, well, you made your own bed. You got to lay in it. He's saying, even if you go down to the depths of the earth and make your bed in hell, still he is there. Another version in verse 9 and 10 in the New King James Version, it says, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, what do those words, wings and uttermost, mean? If I take the wings of the morning, the wings is the edge or the extremity. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, that's the last or the end. And I think I used to read that as some beautiful poetry of, oh, the wings of the, if you ride on the wings of the morning or you, you dwell in the depths of the sea, <clears throat> but maybe it's not. It's more of a realization that no matter how far or desperate that we might be, he is still there. And in Psalm 139, 11 through 12, it says this, if I say, Surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Friends, at the end of our rope, at the very edge, the, the uttermost edge of our hope, when we've gone as far as we can go, when we want to hide, when we feel like darkness is all around, here is what the Lord says. In Isaiah 4, 43, 6, I love this verse. It says this, I'll send orders north and south. Send them back. Return my sons from distant lands, my daughters from faraway places. I want them back. Every last one who bears my name. Every man, woman, and child whom I created for my glory, yes, personally formed and made each one. And I don't know if you needed to hear that today for your own heart, your own soul, your own life, or if you needed maybe to hear it for someone else that you love, that God says there is, there is no wing, there is no uttermost part that is too far that I won't demand them and call them back. I want every man, woman, child that I created for my pleasure to be under my wings. And in Romans 8, 38, Josh said it was okay if I read scripture the whole time, right? That's, that's all. You said that's fine. Then you put less of you in it, and that's, that's good. But I don't want you to hear from me today. I want you to hear from him today. And so I'm reading a lot of scriptures, and we're going to read through this whole psalm too. But just, just listen with your spirit. Romans 8, 38 says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love that God is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Psalm 139, in the scriptures that we just read, it reminds us of this. God can reach us in the place of darkness. He can reach us in the place of development and in the place of distress. Darkness, development, and distress. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to go to verse 13, and it says, For you created my inmost being. 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You were made with personal care by God. And in all of God's power, he could have made anyone else, done anything else, and he chose to create you. Nobody in this room or on this earth is an accident or a mistake. God knit and weaved us all together with purpose and passion, with the intent to love and to be loved. And he knows us because he made us. The mother's womb in that verse 13 is the secret place in verse 15. And in that place where even a mother may not be aware of that embryonic life, God was at work creating a being that has a body of incredible intricacy, a spirit capable of relationship with the God who created the heavens and the earth. Okay, I'm about to get homeschool teacher on you. Many of you know that I became a teacher this year, uh, this past year, and with many cheerings of many friends, because that was not really in my um, life plan to become a teacher, but I loved to learn, and I love um, <clears throat> to find out new things that I didn't know before. And so I'm going to read something to you, and I read it to Josh last night just to make sure, like, this isn't too long, it isn't too much, but it's so interesting. So I'm going to pull an old Pastor Rick phrase out and say, put on your thinking caps and listen with me. <clears throat> Consider the miracle of the human body. Every second, more than 100,000 chemical reactions take place in your brain. It has 10 billion nerve cells to record what you see and hear. That information comes to your brain through the miracle of the eye, which has 100 million receptor cells, rods and cones, in each eye. Your retina also has four other layers of nerve cells. All together, the system makes an equivalent of 10 billion calculations a second before an image even gets to the optic nerve. Once it reaches your brain, the cerebral cortex has more than a dozen separate vision centers in which to process it. Your tear ducts supply a bacteria-fighting fluid to protect your eyes from infection. The tears that fight irritants differ from the tears of sadness, which contain 24% more proteins. That's not to mention the miracle of the ear and how it translates sound waves into meaningful speech and sounds or of touch, taste, and smell. You have more than 200 bones, each shaped for its function, connected intricately to one another through lubricated joints that cannot be perfectly duplicated by modern science. More than 500 muscles connect to these bones. Some will obey willful commands and others perform their duty in response to unconscious commands from the brain. They all work together to keep us alive. The heart muscle itself beats over 103,000 times each day, pumping your blood cells a distance of 168 million miles. And I haven't even mentioned the complexity of human cells. A single human chromosome, a DNA molecule, contains 20 billion bits of information. How much is that? What would be its equivalent if it were written down in an ordinary printed book in modern human language? 20 billion bits are the equivalent of about 3 billion letters. If there are approximately 6 letters in an average word, the information content of a human chromosome corresponds to about 500 million words. If there are 300 words on an ordinary page of printed type, this corresponds to about 2 million pages. If a typical book contains 500 pages, then the information content of a single human chromosome corresponds to some 
4,000 volumes of 500-page books. That's a single human chromosome. And you can leave here today saying you are smarter than when you came. You all, had a, you all learned a great lesson. You're good students. Now, all of that knowledge may be hidden to us. I didn't know it. I didn't know it till it was all written down and I read it over and over again. But it's not hidden to him. And there's good news today. Completely comprehending God is not the key to life. But him comprehending us is. And in 139... In verse 17, it says this, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. And when I read that verse, all I can think about is this tiny little brain where I try to compute and try to to take in who God is and all the words that are in this book And then I think, and I'm still missing parts or days or hours or minutes where, God, you spared me from things that I never knew about. I probably never will know about. And your thoughts of me, because I think about God a lot. I think about my kids, my family a lot. But it says, your thoughts of me cannot be numbered. There's, There's not, they said, I wrote this down, it says, We cannot conceive how many of God's kind counsels have been concerning us, how many good turns he's done us, and what variety of mercies that we have received from him. If we could count them, just the heads of them, much more the particulars of them, then they are more in number than the sand. Yet everyone is great and very considerable. And there's no way for us to compute that or to register that, that over and over again, maybe in times in your life when you've said, God, are you there? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Do you know? And he has gone before you. He's before you and behind you, just as this verse said, hemming you in and saying, I've kept you from so much for your good. And there is so much coming that you still cannot see. So now we're going to go to verse 19. And I just want to say something about this. This is, um, if you grew up in church or, you know, you're like in youth group and you're off in a corner reading Psalm 139 and it's just like, oh, this is so good. God, you know me and you made me and I'm wonderful. And then you might have just skipped over 19 through 22. And there is kind of, um, it's just, I'll call it just, it comes out of left field. Um, and it's not one that at Hobby Lobby they have on, on frames or cups. They don't. This one's just a little bit different. And so I'm going to read it to you. It says, and mind you, he's, he's in this deep, like, like, just wonderful moment with the Lord. And all of a sudden, like mood shift. And he says, oh God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. Oh Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred for your enemies are my enemies. And it's really funny because literally it's just that little stanza right there and we're going to go right back into something else. But why? Why does he why does he come in and this just like throws this part in saying shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? And in this body and soul examination that we have made in 139, maybe these verses are far more fitting than we think. We don't always think of God as a God who hates things. Some do. Some, um, I saw a, an interview recently, and they said that um, it was, I think it was at Baylor University, actually, that they did this interview of students asking six different, like, viewpoints of God. And 39% of the students said he is angry and just going to come down on us with fire. Like, that's almost... Four out of 10 students felt that way. So maybe you do have that view of this angry God. 
But in the rest of this chapter, it's a lot of, he's a good shepherd, he's Abba Father, he's our creator, he's so loving. There's so much, so much about love in this word. But do you know what, oh, so oftentimes is even stronger and spoken more directly is truth. And we cannot forget that God is a holy God. In Proverbs 6, Solomon says this, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a proud heart, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. And we don't like to maybe think about God hating anything, but there are things that he despises. It's biblical, and we're called to stand with him in this. And knowing God's greatness, saying all of this that David is saying about him, he wants to be more like him. He's choosing to be an advocate for him in the world. And so should we. So you may not frame that in your home or drink your coffee out of it in the morning, but really it's the same thing of saying, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Let, let my motives line up with your motives. Help me. It's all still part of this search. He's saying, God, make sure that I'm hating what you hate and that I am living a holy life before you. And then we get to 23 and 24. And it says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path to everlasting life. That word search, it means to look into or over carefully or thoroughly in an effort to find or discover something, to examine closely and carefully, to test and try and probe. And I broke this, wor- this search, the this search, if you will, down into three Ps. The first one, as we see all throughout, is the piercing of the search. The search that David talks about is deep. One word that's associated with these verses, it means to dig or unearth. You literally imagine like unearthing the ground. God is digging up to examine intimately, and the piercing of the search might hurt. The next P is the panorama of the search. He says, no, my heart know my thoughts, my ways, you know, whether I'm coming or I'm going, whether I'm lying or I'm sitting, it's very wide, but the panorama of the search also gets very personal. And the last one, which I love so much because it's just like God to do this, is the purpose of the search. He doesn't say, have you ever met somebody that just asks you a lot of questions and you walk away and feel like, did I just give out a bunch of information, but I know nothing about you, and you just kind of dug and dug and wanted to ask a lot of things, but didn't really reciprocate that or didn't really have a purpose for that besides maybe just being nosy or wanting the tea. I don't know. Like just people have that tendency sometimes. There, I've met several of them, and I know that you probably have too, but God is saying this. There is purpose in this search that's going to pierce you, that's going to go far and wide over your life. And the purpose of it says right here is to lead us in the way of everlasting, saying, Lord, I know that you see it all. I know that you know it all, but you created me for purpose. And now I ask you, will you lead me? It's the whole point. The purpose of the search is to have an eternal life. And David recognized that even though that God was intimately aware of every part of him, there was still power in the invitation to have him come and take a look around. He chose not to hide from him, but to be hidden in him. And it's clear in the rest of this psalm 
that the Lord knows us whether we invite him in or not. But when we follow David's lead and invite him to search our hearts, it opens us up to the joy of being known and loved. It allows us to experience, I love this, what is already true of us. To know that we are known and still fully loved allows us to stop hiding. It allows us to stop being defensive or making excuses for our behavior because our failures do not put our identity at risk. It allows us to search our own hearts because we don't have to fear what we will find since what's in our hearts is not what defines us. It allows us to reveal ourselves to others because the only one whose acceptance matters has refused to reject us. It allows us to live in the light because there's no thing that can be discovered that will change the way that God loves you. And David ends this, this psalm not in fear. Not, there, was, there was so many commentaries and funny things about like, oh, was he feeling like all like, you know, like violated or everywhere he went, God was there and it felt like, like too much. And, and he felt, you know, it said, I think that one of the words for him in is just to like siege, like everywhere he went, there was God. And there are definitely times in life when maybe we feel that way when we have things to hide, but he comes to this place and ends it not in fear, but in invitation. He invites God to know him in all of his fullness. And he does this not based on his own. This, this scripture, like I said earlier, is not really about us. It's about him and his goodness and his, his hand on our life and the way that he's cared for us and shaped us and formed us and created us. And we're just, in this story, we're just the little embryonic tiny pin in the darkness of our mother's womb, the scripture is about him. So we come to the question today of, do we hide? Or do we let him search us and be hidden? And last night, as I was just going over this, and I kind of had like a, an idea that of this hiding thought and hidden, and you know, it just kind of kept playing over my mind. And all of a sudden, just the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And sometimes things, you know, we get them a little slower maybe than others, but I was just like, what? Like, God, your word says literally that you are our hiding place. David declared, you are my hiding place. And this word is sether. It means secret place, a way of escape. And I love that so much because he's taking this thing, this hiding place, when we think we need to run and hide, there's nowhere to escape all the things, maybe that we've done or that the world's done to us. And he says, I am your way of escape. Don't hide from me, but come and be hidden in me. It conveys a picture, this refuge of a place which provides shelter or protection from danger, difficulty, or distress. And what a blessing to know that instead of having to run from God, that we can run to him and be safe. I'm going to read you three more Psalms. Psalm 119, 114 says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. 32.7 says, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And 31.20 says, you hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongues. Come back to Colossians 3, and it says, for you died to this life. When we chose him, when we said, yes, God, we believe that you are who you say you are, we die to this life, and our real life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in that glory. 
Will you hide your life in him today? I'm going to read a quote, and Josh said it was a little strong, and that's fine, right? We can get strong in church, but I want you to hear it, and I want it to pierce you, if you will, today. It's by Spurgeon, and it says this, Hiding Christ by grace through faith while today is still called today. If his first coming did not give you eternal life, then his second coming will not. If you did not hide in his wounds when he came as your savior, there will be no hiding place for you when he comes as your judge. You can stand. <laughs> 